Hey, so I want to talk to you guys about diagnostic risk. And to start that conversation, I want you to ask yourself a question. How many diagnoses are you prepared to get incorrect in your day-to-day -day practice? Now, I'm guessing some of you would say none. I want to be the consultant who misses nothing. Some of you might say missing nothing means do many, doing too many tests on the well. And I'm okay with missing some minor stuff. It's just the serious stuff I don't want to miss, which is fair. But it's actually really hard, man. Throughout your career, there are going to be times when you're more of a cowboy and there's going to be more times where you're more paranoid about missing stuff and maybe doing some unnecessary tests that cause harm. And my personal perspective is that in your journey to expertise, you need to find a sweet spot and you've got to accept that that sweet spot will change over time. It should also change based on your patient population. And when you move into a pediatric term, your risk of missing something serious actually decreases on individual patients. And that should change your practice. But you can also start getting anchoring bias, where you assume that everything you see is a benign viral illness. And that means that a few patients coming through our department with something serious could be seriously harmed by our diagnostic miss. And so it's really, really tricky to get right. So let's just cover some basic terms as a refresher, and I promise I'm going somewhere with this, yeah? But I hated statistics and probability when I was in med school. I thought it was pointless and boring and poorly taught, but it's actually really important and critical to everything we do in emergency in particular. So let's talk about sensitivity, specificity, pre-test probability and post-test probability, and the number needed to screen, because these are core concepts that you need to understand to be a good clinician. When it comes to sensitivity, if a test is highly sensitive, it's going to be very likely to detect the presence of a disease that you're worried about. But it might also pick up a fair amount of false positives. Leukocytes on a urine dipstick are a sensitive test. They're pretty good at picking up UTIs. But they also give you a lot of false positives when you start looking at the microscopy. Specificity. So if a test is specific, then it's going to strongly suggest that that patient has that specific disease. Nitrites on a urine dipstick are a specific test. You don't see them that often on your dipsticks, but when you do, you can be pretty damn sure that that patient has a UTI. But if you relied on, UTI on nitrites alone, you're gonna miss an awful lot of UTIs. Which brings us to pretest probability, which is the chance that a kid has the disease you're thinking about before you do a test at all. If we follow our UTI analogy, a three-year-old girl in nappies with vomiting and fever has a much higher pretest probability of UTI than a 10-year-old boy with the same symptoms. Post-test probability is the chance that a kid has the disease you're thinking about after you've done your tests. So if both those kids with vomiting have 150 leaks on microscopy, the girl still has a higher post-test probability of a true UTI than the older boy does. Which brings us lastly to the number needed to screen. So the number of people that need to be screened for a given duration to prevent one adverse event. So if we want to prevent, present, prevent pyelonephritis being missed in our department, we have to screen a certain volume of patients coming through the department as a whole to maintain departmental sensitivity. So here's the challenge with PEDS. Almost every kid you see with a medical symptom has a high pretest probability of being a viral illness. This is just a hard fact based on the epidemiology of our department. We have a mostly immunized, mostly educated, healthy population of children in our catchment who live in some of the best living conditions in the world. So on average, most patients we see have a really low pretest probability of serious disease and they shouldn't have a lot of tests. They're gonna get better no matter what we do. We're at low risk therefore, as individual clinicians of missing something in each individual that we see, even if we do nothing beyond observation and supportive management, which is a good thing. You know? If we see eight patients a day with fever as a resident or a registrar, sometimes you could get through your whole term without seeing anything sinister. And for each individual patient, doing unnecessary tests like blood tests, LPs, CT scans, etc., is more likely to do harm from the test itself than it is to change the outcome of their condition, which is usually just gonna get better. And so a lot of what we do in pediatric emergency is reassurance medicine. 
We assess patients, we make sure they're looking pretty good, not septic, and we reassure the parents and get them home. But there's a catch, right? At an individual level, we're at low risk of missing something sinister. At a departmental level, we see around 35 patients a year, 35,000 patients a year. And that means that our chance of seeing something rare coming through this department, like leukemia or a brain tumor, is actually really high. And it's easy to walk away from your peds term thinking you need to do as much nothing as possible in children. And that's true for a lot of the kids that you see. But it's really crucial to take away the point that it's not all of them. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no reason for us to exist. If you want to be a practitioner who doesn't miss something, you need to consider the rare things too. Otherwise, what we're doing is essentially called frequency gambling. And that's assuming that because something happens nine times out of 10, you can roll the dice a hundred times and never get a one. And eventually that means you'll miss something serious. And believe me, that doesn't feel great when it happens. So how do we get good at not missing the rare stuff while avoiding inflicting kids, uh, while avoiding inflicting unnecessary tests on healthy kids? My personal opinion is that there's really not an easy answer here and that you likely swing at times in your career between being scared of missing the zebras and doing way too many tests and seeing only horses and doing not enough tests. And I really want you to reflect and explore where you are at the moment and where you want to be, right? You will work with consultants who screen for more zebras and you'll work with other consultants who seem to assume it's mostly horses. It's worth reflecting on where you want to be and what your role models are like. For me, being a pediatric emergency physician does mean being comfortable in that gray zone of risk, and in particular being okay with the fact that I'll eventually miss a serious diagnosis. If I wanna miss nothing, that means I've gotta screen everyone, and that's gonna cause harm as well, even though it's harder to measure and it doesn't have the same emotional impact. My personal tips on this are as follows. One is pay attention to the story in pediatrics. A careful history and an examination can rule in a lot of common stuff. And if the story fits well, you probably don't need any tests. Common stuff occurs really commonly. And for most of our patients, we should be doing few invasive things. The only cost of doing a good history though is time, but it's definitely radiation free. As a consultant, I really try and pay attention specifically to the parts of a history that don't fit. It can be easy to start closing your questions and ignoring or filtering out those parts of the story that don't fit with your initial diagnosis. But these can be clues that something's not right and something more rare is happening. A new fever, for example, after a week of early symptoms could be a new early from restarting daycare, but it could also be a pneumonia as a complication of that initial infection. The other thing as a senior clinician is that I really value a parent's perspective. I have to say though, I don't always think that parents are always right. What I do think is that parents have an incredibly valuable data set. They know their kids really well. And if they're telling you something's not right with their child, they're accurate, but not necessarily in a medical way. Yeah, there might be a more benign reason for why their child's not right, or it might be that they haven't seen their kid very sick much. But if they're saying their child has a head tilt that's not there normally, or an abnormal gait that you can't see, or their child with CP and epilepsy is seizing, when we're not sure actually whether those movements are normal or abnormal for them, I'm actually much more likely to believe the parent than my own assessment in that context. Because parents don't come with medical degrees automatically, but they do know their children incredibly well, and their voices have value. When it comes to testing, screening for me with a non-invasive test, like a urine or an ECG, comes at lower cost to a child than a painful one, like an LP or bloods. So I'm gonna feel more comfortable doing a urine or an ECG to screen for rarer things, because it can help me avoid rarer diagnoses without necessarily hurting anyone. I'm not gonna do an LP on every patient with a headache though, because I will cause pain in my efforts to never miss a meningitis. I also have to be okay with doing some tests that come back negative. If every head scan I've done comes back positive, that doesn't make me an amazing clinician. Statistically, it means I'm a specific clinician. And that means I'm getting the right diagnosis when I do the test, but I also might be sending other kids home with more subtle signs who needed scans and they didn't get them. Good population screening does actually involve some tests for patients who aren't definitely gonna come back positive. 
I'm also more comfortable now testing for something rare if I think the impact of missing that diagnosis outweighs the harms of doing that test, even if the condition itself was relatively rare. I'm going to have to do some TTC spines, for example, to make sure I don't send someone home with a fractured neck, and I can't beat myself up when the test comes back negative. I also have to be okay with the occasional miss. Yeah? It's impossible to never miss something serious in my practice, but I can mitigate that with good clinical communication. I can get good at giving good safety netting, ensuring adequate follow-up, and explaining reasons to return to families well. I also have to keep auditing and reflecting on my practice. What have I missed and what tests have I maybe done excessively? Could observation and time have actually been a less invasive test that would have given me the same answer without the same impact on the patient? rather than rushing someone through the scanner or committing them to a septic screen that wasn't really indicated. This is a case of extremes. When we're on one extreme or the other, it's relatively easy to see that we're off track, but we all need to be somewhere in the middle and will vary with time. In short, there's a sweet spot between being a cowboy and sending everyone home in the department and sending everyone home in the department for a full body MRI. The longer you work, the more rare stuff you'll actually see that you'll realize you need to screen for. But also the longer you work, the more comfortable you'll be with normal patterns of illness or illness scripts as they're called, and which patients don't need any tests at all. There's no easy answer, but I encourage you to think deeply about who your clinical role models are and how they approach risk within the pediatric ED. Ask genuinely open questions about why we're doing a particular test and that can be really helpful both to learn from seniors as a trainee, but it also helps us keep us honest as senior clinicians by making sure that we justify our thought processes and keeping ourselves internally accountable. Because for all of us, it's a continual journey of readjustment over time. And hopefully we can find the best sweet spot that works for us, that harms the least amount of patients and helps the most that we can. <laughs>